Uh, hello class. So today we're going to cover transcriptional and post-transcriptional control. So the first um, part of this lecture is going to be um, basically some more on transcriptional control and some epigenetics and then the second part will cover um, post-transcriptional control. Um, so just a quick review from last time. Um, the proper control of transcription is actually one of the most important processes in a cell. All right, and I mentioned last time that there's about 1,800 transcription factors in a mammalian cell, and these are all set up in sort of transcriptional networks. Um, and as we saw from last time, these sort of function alone as homodimers. They can function as heterodimers, um, and many of the same, many different transcription factors can function at the same locus to sort of integrate signals. Right, and, and that goes with the activators and repressors, and then there's co-activators and co-repressors, and a lot of that is sort of um, interpreted by mediator. Um, and I also mentioned that the transcriptional program uh, changes throughout development, and we'll look at an example of that today. And eventually you get to this point where um, you've basically gotten to terminal differentiation, and that's cell memory. That's when a cell is uh, basically been committed to a certain cell type, and it exists as that cell type um, for its, its entire existence. Um, <clears throat> So here's an interesting little um, regulation uh, system that basically works in salmonella, and it's a, it's a gene switch. So normally what you have is this sort of um, invertible segment, okay, that, that actually has a promoter, um, and that will drive expression of the H2 in a repressor. And the repressor actually goes on and then represses H1. So when the invertible segment is in this orientation, um, the H1 gene is off. Um, but this can actually switch um, and flip and invert so that it, the promoter is actually opposite H2 and so you don't have any H2 expression or any of the repressor and that basically leads to expression of H1. Um, so this is sort of a rare example um, of how you can control gene expression by recombination and inversion. Um, and, you know, this is, like I said, it's a rare example, but it's a cool one nonetheless. Um, we saw this slide last time where we were looking um, at yeast mating and the transcriptional networks that exist in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Here's just basically all of the chromosomes in Saccharomyces. Um, and, you know, what's I think important to note is that, you know, here are all these little promoter elements and enhancers that exist in Saccharomyces. And if we look a little closer, um, you have to understand a little biology um, behind yeast. So yeast can actually exist in sort of three different cell types. Okay, there's two haploids, an A cell and an alpha cell, and then there's a diploid, which is considered A alpha. Okay, so the haploids are have one copy of each chromosome, um, and like I said, the mating type can either be um, little a or it can be alpha. Um, and the diploid actually exists as an A alpha. Okay, and so that leads to basically different genes. You can have A specific genes, um, ASG over here, alpha specific genes, or haploid specific genes. And depending on the cell type, uh, you'll get expression of the genes. And here's sort of how it works. So in an A cell, um, what you have is expression of the MAT A1 gene. And that actually has no effect. And so MCM1 will express alpha-specific genes. Now, in the haploid, you're going to get basically MAT alpha-1 and MAT alpha-2. And what happens is MAT alpha-2 is a repressor and it binds to MCM1 and prevents expression of A-specific genes, whereas MAT alpha-1 um, is like a co-activator and that helps MCM1 express alpha-specific genes. And then in the diploid, you have MAT alpha-2 and MAT A1 expressed, and what ends up happening is the A-specific genes are repressed in the same way they were in the um, alpha haploid strain, but then you have MAT A and um, MAT alpha coming together to do the haploid, to express the haploid-specific genes.
Um, so this is just a, a really excellent example of how cells can integrate signals and use different combinations of transcription factors depending on the cell type that exists. And I want you to go back and sort of take in the big picture here and think about the 1800 transcription factors that exist in mammals. Okay. Um, now, there's different modes of regulation, and a, a common one, and we'll see this again uh, in epigenetic inheritance, um, but you can have positive feedback. Okay, so here's just a cell um, with a gene in it, and it's not expressing, and then it can get a transient signal, which can actually turn on expression of protein A, and protein A is a transcription factor, and then you'll get, you know, transcription, and then translation of the messenger RNA, and then the A actually makes up a transcription factor, which then leads to promote its own expression. And so ultimately what you'll have is all of these cells eventually expressing A and A doing its function. Okay, and so positive feedback oftentimes will amplify a result and then it sort of stays around for a while. Um, and you not only have um, positive feedback, uh, but there's also um, negative feedback, and both positive feedback and negative feedback loops are quite common, and here's sort of an example of how they work. A turns on A, and in this case, in negative feedback, production of A will actually uh, shut off A's activity. Um, you can have transcription factors set up in a flip-flop device where A is repressing B and B is repressing A, and this can oftentimes lead to oscillations. And then you can also have feed-forward um, loops where A can lead to expression of B and A also leads to expression of, of Z and the combination will give higher levels of expression of Z. Okay, so all of these different sort of um, feed-forward loops uh, actually um, sort of work in um, expression and regulation of transcription. Um, here's sort of an example of a feed-forward loop and how it works. You'll get an input, and that leads to A, A leads to B, and both A and B lead to um, whatever output there is. And oftentimes you have to have a duration of time in order for the a duration of time for the input to actually get an output. Okay, so if you have just a short burst of input, that may not actually lead to an output, but if you have sustained input, um, that's enough time to sort of lead to A and B and, and then Z, and so you'll have sort of a gradual increase in this. Now, a perfect example of this um, actually is in the circadian clock, which we'll talk about in just a second, but you guys can all sort of appreciate this. You have certain genes in your body that are expressed in the morning and then others that are expressed in the evening, and there's a class of evening-specific genes, um, and what happens is in the morning you synthesize a repressor, and then later in the afternoon, you um, produce an FBOX protein and a ubiquitin ligase, an E2, and that actually degrades the repressor so that the gene can be expressed in the evening. So it's just a good example of how, like, all of these sort of feed-forward loops can sort of connect, and they don't necessarily have to be activators. They can also be repressors and the removal of a repressor and, you know, that type of thing. And just to give you an idea of how complicated this can all get, um, here's just a gene circuit of a sea urchin, okay? And so you have maternal and early signals um, on transcription factors, and then you'll have a whole bunch of interpretation machinery in there that are all interconnected. Um, and then what you'll get is output, and you can have mesoderm uh, differentiation or endoderm differentiation. And so if you want to sort of think about how complicated mammals are relative to a sea urchin, you can see that this probably gets expanded quite a bit. Um, now, you can also have um, a gene circuit oscillator. Okay, and we'll look at the circadian clock in the next slide, but what ends up happening is um, if you have a whole bunch of negative feedback and negative feedback loops connected together, what you're going to get is oscillations. Okay, so if you stop and you think about it, and here you have a binding site for C, which is a repressor, but if the repressor's not around, you'll get expression of um, this A gene, which produces a repressor. That repressor will bind to um, to B, and um, it'll repress B, and then the B repressor uh, 
won't be made and so it can't repress C, so C will be expressed. And what ends up happening here, this is sort of a, a difficult slide to explain, but I hope you guys can all sort of appreciate it, that these repressors um, are all sort of um, interconnected and so that when they're repressing, there's no expression, but then when there's no expression, there's no repression. Um, and the repressor is lost, and then you get activation, and what it ends up leading to is oscillations. Okay, it's a little bit easier to explain with the circadian clock. So for those of you who don't know, the circadian clock is actually um, sort of what controls our daily rhythms and gene expression throughout our body. Um, and the word circadian it comes from Latin. It's uh, circa for being about and dn being day. Um, and here's actually the the negative feedback loop sort of shown in the Drosophila um, circadian clock, where you have these two genes, timeless or TIM, and period or PER, and the PER and TIM genes are actually um, activated by two transcription factors that aren't shown here, um, but they'll lead to expression of the messenger RNAs. The messenger RNAs will produce the, uh, the TIM and the PER protein, and the um, TIM and the PER protein will then heterodimerize and actually enter the nucleus um, and repress their own expression. And so by doing that, you actually have a basically 24-hour rhythms in gene expression, um, and this occurs actually in, in mammals as well. Yeah. Um, now, an important thing that I want you guys all to know, too, is about nuclear hormone receptors. And, and the, the example that your book uses is the glucocorticoid um, receptor and the glucocorticoid ho hormone right here. So here you have, shown in green here, the glucocorticoid um, receptor and then the glucocorticoid ho hormone. This will actually uh, passively diffuse into the cell and then into the nucleus and it'll bind to the glucocorticoid receptor and cause it to become activated. Okay, and when it's activated, it'll typically associate with um, other uh, co-activators and other transcription factors to help drive gene expression. So when there's no glucocorticoid ho hormone around, um, you'll have sort of low levels of expression. And then when the glucocorticoid hormone is present, it binds to the glucocorticoid receptor um, to drive high levels of expression. Now, we sort of saw this last time when we were looking at the CHIP-seq and the CHIP-seq of the estrogen receptor. So these nuclear hormone receptors are actually a whole family of, of proteins, and I sort of want you just to, to think of them as, you know, uh, transcription factors that where hormones can enter into the cell and then drive expression, right? So when there's estrogen around, it will, you know, passively diffuse into um, the the cell and then it'll bind to the estrogen receptor which is a transcription factor and that causes it to bind to DNA and drive expression of estrogen responsive genes. And the glucocorticoid um, hormone works um, in basically the same way. Um, now when you get down to development, development actually becomes um, you know a much more sort of complicated question uh, under transcriptional regulation, okay? And so if you look at basically muscle formation, um, muscle is formed by basically fusion of myoblasts and, and they're multinucleate. And if you look at this uh, muscle cell here, you can see there's actually a couple nuclei in it. Um, and so the way it works with myogenic regulation is you'll get a signal from the environment, um, which will lead to activation of myoD and myoG, my5 and, and um, MRF4. Um, and these actually lead to expression of structural genes um, as well as the expression of MEF2, okay, and that will lead to muscle development, and there's some positive feedback in here. But the key factor in this, the transcription factor, is actually called MyoD, okay? And so I'm just trying to show you that there's these sort of feed forward loops and feedback loops, um, positive and negative, that help in regulation um, of cell types. Um, and we can really see that with developmental reprogramming. Um, and so if you have just a, play, a plain old embryonic stem cell, uh, you can get induction of a single regulatory protein, um, and then all of a sudden the cells will divide, um, and, you know, which can and the transcription factor may go with one cell and then you'll get induction of other regulatory proteins and eventually the different cells will all have groups of different transcription factors um, 
in the different cell types and that actually leads to all of the different tissue development that, that occurs in a, a complex mammal. Okay, and just remember there's over 1,800 transcription factors in mammals. Um, and as it comes to uh, embryonic stem cells, and we'll look at this later, you can actually go backwards. You can drive a fibroblast to become um, uh, what's called an IPS cell or an induced pluripotent stem cell. And you can add these four transcription factors, KLF4, SOX2, OCT4, and MYC. Um, and these are called the, the Yamanaka factors. And these can take just a plain old cell and turn it into a stem cell. And then you can cause that induced pluripotent stem cell to develop into different tissue. And I'm really sort of emphasizing this because there's right now there's um, really great interest in this, especially when you guys who are heading into sort of the medical profession um, and into research, you know, you can start to appreciate that uh, you know, when it comes to needing a transplant or something like that, if you could actually grow an organ in a laboratory from an induced pluripotent stem cell, you, you really uh, sort of no longer need to find donors for organ transplants, which oftentimes is, is very difficult. You could just theoretically take a person's um, fibroblasts, induce it into a pluripotent stem cell, and then cause it to develop into a specific tissue that that patient then may need um, to have, let's say, a liver transplant. You could grow a little bit of the liver or, you know, any kind of uh, transplant like that. Um, and there's actually instances where um, people who have had uh, sort of, um, you know, esophageal cancers and stuff like that can actually have parts of their esophagus um, removed and grown in the lab and then put back in. Those are the only ones that I know of right now that are sort of um, been done. Um, um, and so the, sort of building on that, um, you can have basically cellular transformation, okay? Because oftentimes the transcription factors are what's going to give the cell its identity. And so here's a kind of a neat experiment that was done in Drosophila. So here's um, a fly embryo right here. And so you'll have, a, in the embryo, you'll have a group of um, cells that will give rise to the fly eye, and then another group of cells that will give rise to the um, adult leg. And if you ectopically express a gene needed for eye development called uh, EY, the EY gene in Drosophila, you can actually develop an eye on the leg of um, a Drosophila. Okay, so if you artificially have express this um, EY gene, um, you can actually get eye development onto the leg. And if you don't believe me that that can actually happen, here's a nice little image of it where you have a Drosophila leg right here, and you can see the Drosophila eye has formed here. Okay, um, and so using systems like this, they've sort of been able to figure out eye development in Drosophila, and so what ends up happening is you'll get sort of a, a signal, um, and then uh, expression of a transcription factor called TOI or twin of eyeless, and that promotes eyeless expression, um, EY, and then EY will actually uh, cause expression of sinoculus and eye absent, EYA, and Dashund. Um, and the combination of these, which also have um, sort of feedback, positive feedback loops in them, um, will actually lead to eye development in Drosophila. Okay, so these are just some examples, and I think if you guys sort of go back to the sea urchin um, graft where you see all the sort of gene circuits that are there, you can really appreciate, you know, how complex this is, and it's one of those things that, you know, scientists will be spending the next uh, probably 100 years um, sorting it all out from development of an embryonic stem cell to a specific type of tissue. Um, and it's an area of, of great interest in the scientific community. Okay, so now we're gonna switch a little to epigenetics. Um, but first, uh, we're gonna look at um, sort of DNA methylation. And this has come up in a number of lectures, but um, cytosine can actually be methylated on the number five carbon. And when you have it, you have just the, basically the methyl group right here. And this methyl group is actually added by DNA methyltransferases, or DNMTs, okay? Um, and there's a couple of different kinds of DNA methylation. 
Um, one is maintenance methylation. So there's regions in our genome that are basically methylated, and every time the cell divides and replicates its genome, the methyl marks are actually um, replaced. Okay, so, and so here you have um, basically a methylated cytosine. Um, they occur on CPGs. You often have um, unmethylated CPGs as well. And so after this undergoes DNA replication, um, the methyl mark here will sort of serve as a docking site for the maintenance methylation or the maintenance methyl transferases, which will then add the methyl group on. And the same thing happens here, where on the um, template strand, um, you'll have the methylation, and then the methyl mark is put back on to the um, on the newly synthesized strand. And this all sort of occurs through semi-conservative replication. Um, now, you can have repression in de novo methylation as well, okay? So um, you, you know, and we sort of saw this with the RNAi-mediated heterochromatin, um, where you can have sort of a histone reader-writer enzyme that can actually put on a heterochromatic mark and then that can actually lead to spread, and then eventually the DNA methyl transferases will come in and add the methyl groups to the enzymes, and then you'll have methyl DNA binding proteins, or MBDs as they're called, for methyl DNA binding, okay? Uh, that's what the acronym MDB stands for. Um, and so this is just um, one mode of sort of regulation, um, and oftentimes you'll get a seeding event and then a spreading event. Um, and this can happen in different cellular processes. One um, such process is called um, imprinting. Um, and this is really important. I want you guys to sort of um, understand this, how it works. Okay, so, you know, in a typical mammal, you're, you're going to have a class of imprinted genes. Okay, and what it means to be imprinted means that the expression comes from either your paternal side or the maternal side. Okay, and so in this case, you'll have an imprinted allele and only one gene is expressed either from the maternal copy or from the, um, while the par parental copy um, is oftentimes epigenetically silenced. Okay, so this is inherited from the father and both the female and the male mice, so only the maternal copy of the gene is expressed. Okay, then when the cells actually go through um, the germline and you're producing germ cells, eggs and sperm, what ends up happening is you get the removal of the female imp um, imprint. Uh, if there is one, it can actually, you know, you'll basically have, uh, you know, this parental copy, which was imprinted, will get removed. So then all of a sudden, in both the female imprints are established and you don't, and these are sort of potential to be expressed. But in the case with the male, the exact opposite happens where you have this uh, gene which came from the mother which then actually gets silenced um, and then you'll have your male imprint established where you know the little red dots here are supposed to indicate DNA methylation. Okay, and then when the sperm and the egg come together, what you're going to end up having is basically um, the maternal imprint established again where you're only getting expression from maternal copy of the gene and not the paternal copy of the gene, okay? And so the offspring will actually sort of differ um, in the allele that's expressed here, okay? And it sort of goes back to, you know, to where the gene came from, from your grandparents. Okay, so this is just uh, something I, I really want you guys to appreciate. And the mechanism that it sort of works with is, is uh, pretty well worked out. Um, and sort of the way it works is you have this protein called CTCF, okay, and, and that binds to an insulator element, okay, and if CTCF is bound there, it, it, what it, it's actually doing is creating a gene loop, um, or so it's believed, and this enhancer from the maternal inherited copy um, can't actually lead to expression of this IGF2 gene. Okay, now in the paternal copy of the gene, the insulator element's actually methylated, and that prevents CTCF um, from interacting with the insulator element, and the enhancer can then actually lead to activation of the IGF2 gene. Okay, um, it's a little more complicated than this, and IGF imprinting also requires this non-coding RNA 
H19, um, but that's a little bit beyond the scope of this uh, course to be talking about. But I just wanted to, to bring it to your attention um, because oftentimes H19 can be misregulated, um, especially if there's, and that can lead to issues with imprinting and other things. Um, Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about CPG islands. And this is something that I really want to sort of drive home to you guys. So throughout the mammalian genome, there's these things called CPG islands, okay? And the CPG islands can occasionally, or CPGs can oftentimes be methylated, okay? But in general, the vast majority of CPG islands are not methylated, and we'll see why in a second. But these CPG islands can oftentimes um, uh, exist upstream of... Uh, specific genes and they're oftentimes um, very important for the regulation and in the rare event that they do become methylated they can oftentimes shut down the expression of a gene because what you're ending up getting is some like heterochromatin and DNA methylation um, which then can interfere with the um, with the expression of the gene okay and so here's just a couple of different examples of some genes that have CPG islands in them um, and the reason I want to really drive home the message of why CPG islands are typically unmethylated is because if you have deamination of the 5-methyl cytosine, um, it's convert, first converted to a uracil, and then when the DNA is copied, it becomes a thymine. So evolution is basically selected for unmethylated CPG islands. And this is something that I really want you guys to appreciate. Most CPG islands are unmethylated. Okay, there are some that are, and sometimes they become methylated in disease states, um, but, you know, in general, they're unmethylated. And here's sort of a, an example of that. These lines right here, um, on this gene are actually representing CPG dinucleotides, okay? And so in our vertebrate ancestor DNA, we had all of these CPGs, um, and then if they become methylated, and then the methyl, the 5-methyl cytosine um, basically uh, becomes deaminated, it becomes a uracil, and then if it's copied, um, what's going to end up happening is the uracil is going to be converted to a thymine. And so what would end up happening through many, many years of evolution would be that those CPG, um, those methylated CPGs will be lost. Okay, and so typically the CPG island remains unmethylated. Um, okay, so now let's just talk a little bit about epigenetic inheritance. Um, so there's different modes of epigenetic inheritance, and if you guys remember, I think it was like lecture three or something like that, I, I sort of defined epigenetics. But epigenetics is the transfer of a heritable state, okay, and this can be activation or repression, and it occurs independent of the DNA sequence, okay. And so what you can have um, is uh, epigenetic inheritance with activation, where you'll have a, a gene, and then all of a sudden that uh, gene gets expressed and it's auto-regulated in a positive feedback loop um, and so when this cell divides um, this gene pattern where A is expressing A is going to be maintained okay unless there's something to change it okay so activation in epigenetics is, is sort of um, you know one of the most obvious but it's actually one of the least appreciated um, when you stop and think about it. For the past couple of decades, everybody's sort of been looking at epigenetic silencing, um, and they haven't been really paying much attention to this. And actually, this may be a very, very important mechanism, um, you know, and driver of disease, okay? Because if this happens, you can also have expression of activators and repressors, um, which could theoretically then change the whole transcriptional program of a cell. Um, now, another area of epigenetic inheritance is silent chromatin, okay, and this has really been a, the focus of the research committee community um, for the better part of 15, 20 years now. Um, and so what you can have is basically a cell with active chromatin, and then there's some sort of signal that basically leads to um, histone modification and potentially, you know, silent chromatin state, and that new silent chromatin state is inherited. Um, there's some debate about this mechanism, um, and I'm sort of on the fence about it. You know, many believe that it's all sort of based on uh, DNA methylation, 
um, and you know there's arguments against it we'll see in the next slide um, there has been reports where I've seen that I've seen where h3k27 um, methylation is can actually be inherited through the male germline so you can have transgenerational epigenetic inheritance um, and there's some pretty good evidence for that um, you can also have epigenetic inheritance with DNA methylation. Uh, so you'll have basically an unmethylated region of the, the DNA, and then all of a sudden you'll get a signal for it, and there's de novo methylation, and then that de novo methylation is then converted to ma maintenance methylation, um, and this new methylated state becomes um, inherited. Just some caveats on this. Um, there's a lot of scientists in the field that sort of have really strong beliefs about DNA methylation being sort of the pre premier epigenetic mark, okay, the, the, the major mark of methylene, of, of silencing. Um, and one of the interesting things is that it's sort of impossible to prove, okay, and, and all the evidence is sort of based on correlation and not proof, okay. Um, and one of the reasons that it's sort of correlation and not proof is that in the case with mammals, DNA methylation is, is essential for viability. So you can never really prove it. Um, and some of the arguments against it being a premier epigenetic mark is that organisms like Drosophila um, don't have any um, DNA methylation, but they still have epigenetic inheritance. Um, so it, it's clear that DNA methylation patterns can be inherited um, and that they change with age um, and they're altered in cancer cells uh, and there's still, but there's still a lot of work to be done and it's a very, very, very complicated um, topic um, in the research uh, community. Um, okay, so another mechanism of epigenetic inheritance is also um, protein aggregation. And I have to be quite honest, I'm not really sure of the, the current thinking on this one. Um, but, you know, you'll have a normal folded protein, and then that normal folded protein becomes uh, sort of misfolded and forms protein aggregates. And these aggregates, as the cell divide, will continue to seed more and more aggregates. Um, and so just when you sort of think about all of these modes of, of epigenetic inheritance from, from basically activation, um, silent chromatin, DNA methylation, and protein aggregation, um, sort of just keep in the back of your head that, that molecular and cellular biology is never simple. And it's oftentimes, you know, going to be a combination of multiple factors um, in this and not just one single one. Um, and so here's just sort of a, a final tie-up slide with, with epigenetics. So here's two identical twins. They have basically um, identical genomes, but as they age, you know, these two uh, individuals have aged differently. Um, this guy looks like he's lived a much more healthy lifestyle than the gentleman here um, on the other side. And so ultimately, you know, environmental factors can also you know, have a strong influence on phenotypes. Okay, so that's all I really have for um, part uh, A. Um, I'll pick up part B in just a second here.